Thank you very much indeed. Today I want to talk about inequality, both in the public sector and beyond. And I want to talk about why it matters for building a society in which all can reach their potential. And we meet as guests of Mary Ward House in the room that a hundred years ago was the site of a famous debate on women's suffrage between Mary Ward and Millicent Fawcett. And while we celebrate the advances that they secured, we are still very far from being the fair society that we need to be. A hundred years later, indefensible inequalities still exist in Britain. Inequalities of income, inequalities of opportunity, inequalities rooted in prejudice and imposed by social injustice. And we see the consequences of these inequalities in the professions, in the media, in the arts, in sport, and in public service. Now, the specific nature of the problem that we face in public service and in the civil service is laid out in the Bridge Report published today. And the Bridge Report is a call to action on my part as Paymaster General. But the fight against inequality is a struggle that engages us right across government. The brute facts of inequality demand a strong and united response. In Britain today, around 13% of people are from an ethnic minority. Yet only 7% of judges, 6% of FTSE 100 leadership, and just 4% of the senior civil service are. On another measure, only 4.4% of successful applicants to the civil service fast stream are from working class backgrounds, in comparison to the third of the population in employment who are working class. Money, it turns out, can't buy me love, but it still buys a golden ticket to the heart of the establishment, and that is just not fair. And why am I speaking out about this? After all, I'm white and male. I went to both Oxford and Cambridge. I'm from the north, but Unlike you, Lenny, I've lost my accent. But the reason I'm in public service now is because I believe that everyone should have the chance to reach their potential, whatever their background. That no one should be defined by the circumstances of their birth. No one should be held back by poverty or ethnicity or culture. And that each individual has something precious to give. And it is our task to help them unlock it. And for me, a commitment to making opportunity more equal isn't just an ethical imperative, although it certainly is that. It also makes sound business sense. All the evidence shows that organizations work better when they are more diverse. Publicly traded companies with male-only executives perform worse than those with male and female executives. And higher ethnic diversity is linked to increased earnings in companies too. We need to think as well about diversity not just in terms of the legally protected characteristics, gender, sexual orientation, race and disability, but in terms of making sure that institutions are full of people from different backgrounds, experiences and attitudes who approach the same problem in different ways. That way you get better decisions, more interesting solutions, and ideas that you simply don't get from a monochrome team. Now, in the most dynamic societies, there's a fluidity between the bottom and the top, and talented, hard-working people have a chance to get on whoever they are and wherever they come from. So inequalities of race and gender and income, sh should they bother us? My answer is emphatically yes. We should care about people getting filthy rich. Why? Well, first of all, because we care deeply about social mobility. And there is clear evidence that countries with higher income inequality have lower levels of social mobility. As Miles Korak has eloquently put it, there is a great Gatsby curve that links inequality to social mobility. Put it another way, it's harder to climb the ladder of opportunity 
if the rungs are further apart. We've got to put more rungs on that ladder. Second, because we should care that rewards for effort are fair. When two people with the same talent work just as hard, isn't it fair that they get the same reward? Fairness, of course, is different from equality. The pursuit of equality of outcomes alone can end up being deeply unfair and lead to an unjust something-for-nothing system. Rather, fairness is about just rewards. The idea that you get in, you get, what you get out should be proportional to what you put in. After all, society rests on consent, and social solidarity is good in itself. So everyone should get a fair crack of the whip. But even on this basis, inequality matters, because yes, in a fair society, individuals should face the consequences of their choices and efforts, but no, people should not be punished or held back for circumstances beyond their control. Third, for me, this is an issue that is too important to be left to the Labour Party. When the system isn't fair, delusions get a hearing and everyone ends up poorer. In the old 1970s approach to tackling inequality, with penal tax rates, maximum wages, uncontrolled spending, mass nationalisation, state control, these have been tried time and again, both in this country and around the world, and they have comprehensively failed. And now another generation must win the argument once again. And in the UK, we are making progress. According to the Office for National Statistics, looking at the numbers, inequality is falling. The relentless focus on supporting people who want to work hard and get on, with two million extra jobs and apprenticeships, nearly four million of the lowest paid taken out of income tax altogether, and incentives to make sure that it always pays to work. This has helped to ensure that the inequality, as measured by the Gini coefficient, the standard measure, went down from 33.2 to 32% over the last parliament. And in my view, the radical reforms to drive school standards will help in the longer term. And across the, st the world, the story is the same. In his inaugural speech, President Kennedy said that man holds in his mortal hands the power to abolish all forms of human poverty and all forms of human life. And while much of Kennedy's presidency was taken up trying to avoid the latter, more recently we've been making some extraordinary progress on the former. Over the last quarter of a century, the number of people living in extreme poverty around the world has fallen by half, from almost two billion to less than one billion. And the proportion of the world's population in absolute poverty has fallen by three quarters over my lifetime. The proportion of the world's population that are illiterate has fallen from around half in Kennedy's era to around 18% today. And in fact, the extension of the free market and of free education has brought billions of people out of poverty. It is perhaps the most progressive policy with the biggest impact on the well-being of humanity in history. But while incomes between the bottom and the middle have become more equal, asset price rises and increased return on skills mean that the gap in wealth between the very top and the rest have risen. When Kennedy entered the White House, the share of the income going to the top 1% in the UK was around 3.5%. By the time of the financial crash of 2007-8, it had reached 8.3%. In the UK, we've taken steps to make sure that the broadest shoulders bear the greatest burden. We ended the injustice that had existed where hedge fund managers were paying a lower rate of tax than their cleaners. The over overhaul of stamp duty ensures that the very top pay their fair share. And we're abolishing permanent non-DOM status. And the top 1% of earners now pay a, pay a higher share of income tax, projected to be 27.5% this year, than at any time under Labour. But there is more to do. So we should continue to act in a way that tackles injustice and protects people's economic security from those who would use this concern to practice the destructive politics of envy. 
And I would say this, it runs deep in the conservative tradition that we equalize opportunity, promote fairness, and embrace diversity. After all, we are the party that delivered Catholic emancipation, votes for women, and gay marriage. And I want to see us end inequalities in the public sector too. So let me now turn uh, to that matter. The civil service is, in my view, the civil service is engaged in a mission to improve the lives of the entire country. And in my first speech in this job, I said that to govern modern Britain, the civil service must be more like modern Britain. And the bridge report that we commissioned then pulls no punches, and I'm very grateful to all those who've worked on it. Yes, the civil service has improved, and it compares favorably to many other organizations, both in the public sector and the private sector. The proportion of people from ethnic minorities all declaring a disability are at historic highs, and women represent 54% of the civil service, and we should welcome these changes. But the representation of all these groups at senior levels is still far too low. And when you look more broadly at social background, this is where we find the most glaring inequality. The report finds that the civil service fast stream, still the most prestigious route in, is, and I quote, deeply unrepresentative of the lower socioeconomic groups in our society. Those one in three people employed in Britain today are working class, but only 8% of applicants to the civil service fast stream are for working class backgrounds, and only 4% actually receive offers. And this makes the fast stream less diverse than Oxbridge, where the equivalent figure is 7.2%. In fact, Every group of universities from which the civil service recruits, fast stream applicants are less likely to come from lower socioeconomic groups. And this represents a huge pool of talent that we aren't tapping into. And this must change. As the report says, we are losing out on many other talented individuals who would flourish if given the opportunity. So we need to cast the net wide, not fish in a small pond. What's more, the civil service, as you said, can set an example for others to follow. It wouldn't be the first time it'd done so. Until 1855, access to the civil service was riddled with cronyism and corruption. And after the blunders of the Crimea, the case for reform was unanswerable. And so in 1855, the civil service commission was set up to oversee recruitment on the basis of fair and open competition and to drag white holes kicking and streaming into the 19th century. It had oversee a new system of recruitment based on fair and open competition. And this was the beginning of the permanent civil service, a meritocracy guided by the vital principles of integrity, honesty, objectivity, impartiality that have sustained it ever since and guide it today. If that was the birth of the modern civil service, then another modernization is long overdue. We've had, we have to deal with the perception that the passport to public service is stamped with privilege. So what are we going to do about it? The bridge group was commissioned by me and Jeremy Haywood, the cabinet secretary and head of the civil service. And we commissioned it because we and the whole senior leadership of the civil service are determined to tackle the issue exposes head on. And I think that it is a tribute to the civil service that far from being defensive about these concerns, they are embracing the challenges that it faces. We'll be setting out our full strategy on boosting social mobility in the spring, but I want to sketch out some of the action that we're taking right now. The report calls for a root and branch overhaul of the way the civil service recruits talent. And we need to make promotion fair and based on talent, not time serving. I want to see inequalities of access and of progress ended. Some of this has already started, but it needs rocket boosters. Other parts will be new. First of all, we need to measure the problem. We'll collect postcode and school attended data so we can measure the problem real time. And from this year, we're giving permanent secretaries specific social mobility objectives within their single departmental plans to which they'll be held to account. Next, we're recruiting from outside. Whether we're recruiting from outside or promoting from within, we need to make the selection process as transparent and fair as possible. 
There must be no barriers that might exclude talented people from underrepresented groups. So we're tackling bias, and whether it's conscious or otherwise. We have this autumn introduced name-blind recruitment across 75% of the civil service on the way to making name-blind standard across the public sector. We want a more porous boundary between public service and private endeavour so it becomes the norm, not the exception, to have careers switching between. Today we commit to publishing pay ratios in the civil service for the first time and crucially we're changing the way people apply to join the civil service so we spot potential, not polish. The report finds barriers into the application process, including its intimidating length and the London-centric focus. Yes, our grand buildings in Whitehall are splendid and spectacular, but they aren't exactly designed to make you feel comfortable. So we'll change how and where selection's done, we're shortening the application process, and wherever possible, aligning apprenticeship and graduate recruitment. The report also finds a lack of adequate outreach on university campuses. So we're going to send out existing fast streamers to campuses across Britain. So we look for talent at a wider range of university. And the report also finds minimal outreach to schools. So we'll radically increase mentoring. Earlier this month, the Prime Minister announced uh, the launch of a new national mentoring campaign in schools. And we're going to lead by example, sending pe people to mentor pupils from disadvantaged backgrounds over an academic year. The aim of this is to raise aspiration and instill confidence and to inform and encourage. We're already in 20 schools and I want to see that expanded to at least 200. Apprentices too are central to our task and I thought we had another demonstration today of just how brilliant the young apprentices in the civil service are. In 2013, we launched the apprenticeship Fast Track. It's proved hugely successful, and two of my proudest years in government were the two years I was responsible for the apprenticeship system. Almost 1,000 have come through so far, with, and they've all got this a verve and a diversity and an energy that the apprenticeship system represents. In the civil service, I want to see future leaders are as likely to come from the ranks of fast-track apprentices as they are from fast-stream graduates. I want the Cabinet Secretary of 2050 to be someone who came into the service as an apprentice. And in fact, you may be sitting in this room today. So I can announce today that we will radically expand our apprenticeship scheme. We will recruit recruit at least 750 new fast-track apprentices in September and 200,000 across the public sector by 2020. All these measures taken together add up to the most significant shake-up of civil service recruitment in a generation. Yes, the public sector can provide leadership, but as the Bridge Report says, its findings too have implications for the way all professional firms could recruit for diversity and excellence. So today I've written to the 200 companies who signed up to our Social Mobility Business Compact and urged them to read the Bridge Report and consider its lessons for their own businesses. This is our goal, a Britain that is fair to all, where effort is rewarded, where all have the chance to succeed and to serve their country, where we fulfill that dream held by the seekers of equal opportunity a hundred years ago here, that every one of our citizens who we serve has the opportunity to reach their God-given potential. Thank you very much.